Welcome back everyone. I've got a 1951 Epiphone Emperor Regent. The lower bout is more than 18 inches across. I thought I'd do something a little different this time and play the guitar now before we get into the meat and potatoes of the restoration. So years ago when I was teaching guitar lessons I used this example to sort of explain how the diminished seventh chords can be used as filler chords in between the diatonic chords of any given key. So here's something in D major. So the first three chords would be D major 7, E minor 7, F sharp minor 7. So the diminished seventh chord can be used sort of chromatically in between those chords. So you've got this kind of thing. I'm sure you've all heard this type of thing before. And I'm descending. So top four strings you get. So the neat thing about that is you can just blow a straight kind of D major directly over top of those moving chromatic filler chords and it just seems to work. So I have looped this D major progression and uh, I'm, I'm just going to let that play and kind of noodle over top. Here we go. This is the culprit and this is why that fingerboard lifted and you would never be able to glue it back down. Removing the fingerboard in this case was exactly what needed to be done. So now we're completely in the driver's seat. Well, our new truss rod, replacement truss rod, is installed. There was quite a bit of hand fitting. Let me show you this router jig that I used to get started on this one. Sometimes historically correct is wrong, and this is one of those cases. The uh, original truss rod didn't work at all, and it actually just served to pop the fingerboard off from the nut up to about the fourth fret. This is 1951. By 1953, they had gone to an adjustment at the headstock like this one. Let me show you this jig that I made up. So I cut these hockey pucks to use as indexing pins to hold the jig dead center. So that indexes into the slot. I started by clamping both ends and doing the center 
and then I slipped the jig along to get a little bit further up the neck. So I had to do it a little bit at a time and then I finished the fit by hand. I used the spherical cutter to make this relief cut for the truss rod adjustment. There's no way I want a chance hammering in frets over that top. And that's why we're putting the frets in first. The frets will be high enough that whatever minute discrepancies that we get along the string path, they'll easily come out of the crown of the fret. So I've got some 400 grit that I'm just breezing over and just making sure that there isn't any fragments puckered up on either side of the saw curve that would prevent the fret from seating properly. Okay, we'll chase that top end of the fingerboard now. So this is the procedure I have gone through with every single fret to get this kind of fit. So we start step one, step two, step three, step four, Step six. Step seven. Step eight. So the seventh fret and the second fret will be driven in after the fingerboard is glued back on. These four holes will serve as indexing pins to make sure that the fingerboard is perfectly aligned when we do. So I adjusted those two sliding tabs to where I want them for this particular guitar neck. And a little drop of oil. Now I've closed it up and we're getting ready to install. I'm bringing you in very close here to show you, and you've heard me mention this in numerous videos, be careful not to roll off the outside edge. Otherwise, those frets on the extremity, you'll always feel them. So essentially what I've had to do, and I'll continue to do it, and I'll show you as I go, all of the frets are in but after doing the edge dress there's still an edge now these two frets have been removed the edge is buffed and reinstalled but I'm gonna have to do this to every single fret all the way along remove it buff it and reinstall it so that there is no sharp edges so now you know 
why I mentioned in all those other videos that when you get to the outside edge you want to make sure ultimately it should be sharp to the touch so that when you seat the fret the underside of the crown is firm against the fingerboard or the binding in this case. Much better. Okay, all of the frets are in except the two pilot frets there that we're going to use for indexing the fingerboard. For those of you that watch my channel, you'll know that I'm not a big fan of actually using adhesives to glue frets in. But in this case, it was a combination of crimping the tang of the fret to get a better mechanical fit and then spotting it with basically with four dots of super glue the two outside edges and then two more small dots in the center of the fret. I'm gathering up some Brazilian rosewood dust from this uh, Brazilian rosewood veneer that I have. And we're going to use that to fill up any little chips and gaps from that last fret job where the guy glued the frets in. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. There wasn't a lot of damage, fortunately. Tamping that down in the deeper cavities. So this is the file I'm using. The edges have been ground flush, so it's only this face that is the cutting surface. I'm making my way along here and basically leveling the uh, super glue and rosewood dust first with this file. That brings me in tight to the fret when I'm doing this so we don't go messing up those nice new frets. The CA with that, uh, that glue boost stuff has basically bound it all together. We're doing the lion's share of the leveling with this file. Pretty tedious stuff. <laughs> this is like three times the work of just doing a fret job. But, you know, that's what happens when you got to clean up someone else's mess. But it's the end result that counts. I'm using this brass bristle brush, say that ten times in a row. Just to keep those uh, teeth clean. The Brazilian rosewood is actually pretty gummy. So it's got a high resin content, so this kind of, oh that works much better. Okay, Bring that right down flush. So I'm favoring, tipping the file in just a little bit, kind of favoring that intersection of the bottom of the crown and the uh, rosewood dust filler.
So the razor blade is basically used to scrape up the last of the evidence of any filler or glue from the fingerboard surface. Whatever is on the frets, I'll take care of that after the fingerboard is glued and we're doing our final fret level of dress. So this is the gluing configuration and I should mention everything I did on this guitar so far was done on the XLT. And this is the clamping configuration for finally getting that fingerboard back into place. I'll explain this a little further once the glue sets and we pull those clamps off. I want to bring you in here for a second and show you these hockey puck radius calls that I made. And these were made on that new sander that you saw in the last couple of videos. So I put that radius on there so that when you clamp it presses the two outside edges of the fingerboard to guarantee that you get that nice tight fit. We're on the home stretch with this 51 Epiphone Emperor. This is our truss rod cover and this is done with engraving stock. You can pick this stuff up at any uh, trophy shop by the sheet. So that was cut to size and fitted. I went with a composite Brazilian rosewood and brass because the fingerboard is on a riser a typical nut blank was not high enough for this. It's actually kind of nice because it's got that gold. We've got the EVO frets which are kind of a gold color, gold screws to kind of match the machine head and the rest of the gold hardware. So the next thing I want to show you is a little trick I use for making a riser block and that is our finished riser block for the pick guard. So it's rubber against the top, rubber against the underside of the pick guard and then that little walnut chunk. Well, before this one leaves, I just wanted to give you a look at the back and the neck on this thing. So here's the back of the neck. Yeah, that's a much better angle. Kind of pick up the figure. And this is the back. So it's actually a bird's eye maple back carved. And as you can see, there is a crack. That, I think that crack is from long ago. It's solid though. So someone must have wicked some glue in there at some point. Well, here's another angle of the back. Well, this is it. Mission completed. I wish I could plug it in, but I just realized it's got that little eighth-inch jack. But yeah, I'm going to take it into the studio and just kind of play it acoustically and see what it sounds like. So the controls and the pickup, that Kent Armstrong floating pickup, are retrofits. Well, at long last, the Emperor rises again. <laughs> Man, there were times I thought I was just never going to get there with this guitar. There are just so many challenges, especially that rolled over edge of the fingerboard. Man, that just killed me. It was like doing a fret job three times. But alas, it is done. So we have the brass and Brazilian rosewood composite nut, and of course the new two-way truss rod. So this thing's completely adjustable now. And I found the cord to plug it in. So you will be able to hear it. So I recorded a progression in A. So I've looped that and uh, as always I'll just kind of blow over top and uh, <laughs> let you hear this thing. You know I have to admit when I was when I was at the workbench with this and I kind of sat it on my lap 
to play. The body is huge. Even the neck, it's a thick neck. But I understand now why Joe hooks the strap onto the heel. He's smaller than I am. This, this thing is the biggest guitar I've ever played. It's like 18 inches across the lower boat. So I'm going to let that play and just kind of noodle around and let you hear it. There's basically one pickup, that uh, Kent Armstrong floating pickup uh, with the volume control. And that's it. And believe me, that's all you need with this guitar. Have a lesson.